the show. I'm Phil Vischer. I'm here with Sky Jatani. Hello, Phil. Hi, Sky. And Drew Dick is back. Hey, Phil. Hi, Drew. How are you? Good. It's good to be back. Resident Canadian. A resident yes. Canadian. Yeah. Uh, Drew Dick is the uh, managing editor. That's right. Yep. Managing editor of Leadership Journal. I'm actually holding up a copy of the magazine because we're discussing it this week, which is why Drew is on the show. And I'm doing something a little bit different. I've made a, a change because we had talked for quite a while about adding a fourth chair to the set. Um, and I decided that three is really the ideal number, and it's hard to have a conversation with more than three people. So instead, I'm cycling third voices in and out. So uh, Christian will be here quite often, but we will occasionally cycle her out for Drew or other friends or guests rather than trying to have four here. So if you wonder where Christian is, we're starting a new practice of putting more than one voice in that chair, the middle chair. She'll be back next week. Four is a crowd. Four I is, agree. Yeah, yeah, three's company. Four is a crowd. <laughs> Could be a TV show. I watched that all the time as a kid. And Did I, you? Yeah, and, and I don't know why. That was my just, mom. I don't know who let me. It. it was kind of nasty. Oh, yeah, it was I think a my mom. My mom used to walk by and just kind of shake her head. Yeah, and then really, I think all the innuendo went over my head. Oh, I yeah. see. But what about Love Boat? Oh yeah, I love Love Boat. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. a lot of innuendo and, there. And Fantasy Island. Did that too? Fantasy, yeah. The plane, the plane. Yeah. The plane, boss, boss, hey, the boss. plane. Hey, maybe he should sing the theme song. Speaking of which. <gasps> Tattoo? <laughs> Tattoo. Boss, boss. He's a little bit like Mr. Lunt, actually. <laughs> boss, boss, it's a podcast. What do you know? Boss, it's a podcast. And they got video, boss. Boss, it's a podcast. So lend an ear, because I'm her Velish, her, Val- what was his name? Not Valanche, because that's a different guy. Her- yeah, no, that's the guy from Hollywood Squares. Y- yeah, I don't remember. Because uh, the Phil Vischer podcast starts right here. We'll talk to Sky and... And Drew Dick too, cause he's here for Christian to bring a story about brains here for you, boss. Uh, boss, it's a podcast, so lend an ear. The Phil Fisher podcast starts right here. The Phil Fisher podcast starts right here. And we'll be seeing you on the plane. The plane. Thank you. I should just probably do that every time from here on out. <laughs> I like that. I don't think that would get old. Let's see if we can get this. <laughs> this is the original, I tell yeah. you. Oh, there, there, there he comes. There's Tattoo. He's ringing the bell. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I remember? Oh, here. Herb. Yeah, hey, that's his name. I don't know. Herb. Villachez. Villachez. Right. He, he was in a James Bond movie. He was the, the he little was. sidekick to the man with the golden gun. Was he really? Yeah. Hmm. Wow. The, he looks like a Bond villain. Has, has, a little, has a little person ever gotten to just be a villain villain as opposed to the sidekick of a villain? I'm thinking of, hmm. you know, yeah. Mini-Me. Yeah. 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 Austin Powers. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's just it's discriminatory, is it what is. Right. it is. So uh, last week we talked about, among other things, wild turkeys. And Christian Taylor <clears throat> claimed that there were wild turkeys in her backyard that were flying up into the trees. And Sky and I, and you had to confirm that other people had seen these as well. Yes, yes. Yeah. Like you know, Sky and I were like, turkeys mm. don't fly, Christian. Turkeys don't fly. Everybody knows that. They're not turkeys. They're something else. And she said, no. She said, no, they're flying, and they're turkeys, and they're flying in my trees. <laughs> so we got a, a message from Chris Krushke. Uh, what's that again? Chris <laughs> Krushke. K-R-U-S-C-H-K-E. How do you say that? Mm-mm. It might be Canadian. How yeah. do you say it? No, no, it's not Canadian. You okay. need to buy a vowel. Chris Krushke. <laughs> Chris Krushke. <laughs> <laughs> says, wild turkeys have no problem flying. Domesticated turkeys cannot because of the way we've bred them to have great big breast meat. Don't make any VMA. <laughs> I was just about to <laughs> say so. <laughs> When I was camping near Rapid City, South Dakota, about 20 years ago, we were awakened with the sounds of about 30 wild turkeys around us and up in the trees. I think they're like chickens. They can fly for short stretches. We had a chicken one time that got scared and flew about 60 feet away into the swamp on the other side of the fence, of course. Where the alligators are. I think that's good to know. Yeah, that yeah. chicken didn't last. <laughs> chicken in a swamp. 
up. <laughs> just throw chicken nuggets in that there. That sounds like something I had at Popeye's once. <laughs> Uh, can I can't get an order of that chicken in the swamp. Yeah, it made the swamp extra swampy. That'd be gravy or something. Extra swamp yeah. sauce. <laughs> By the way, that episode of WKRP has got to be one of the funniest bits in TV history. Mr. Carlson, quote: "As God is my witness, I thought turkeys could fly." Do you remember that episode? No, I don't. Oh, it's great. They did a promotion for the radio station where they were going to drop turkeys out of a helicopter onto a crowd of people. <laughs> And they died. Well, and that's they don't show it, which was so great about it, is he just comes in and he's pale and he and he <laughs> says that line and it's just <laughs> the imagination okay. is left to run wild so, like a turkey. <laughs> domesticated turkeys cannot fly because of the way we've bred them to have great big breast meat. I think but, that's but a the, metaphor for a lot in our culture. But the wild ones can fly over short distances. <laughs> wild ones can fly over short distances. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking so of, so you're apologizing to Christian. It's I'm apologizing to Christian of sorts. Okay. Yes, she, yeah. Sounds like I now believe because she's vindicated. Whole, we we moved kind of out into the country of of the of the suburbs, the country of the suburbs, and so we have two acres and by forest preserve, and so I had a whole flock of wild turkeys in my backyard one day, and I was trying to get a picture of them. I was trying to sneak up on them with my camera to get a picture of them, and I realized after trying this, they didn't really care. Because I ended up about two feet from the, the wow. turkeys just taking pictures, and they're just kind of staring at me. It's like, is this my good side? Is this my good side? <laughs> and they didn't fly or anything. No, they, were and they did not fly. Eventually, they just walked away. Is it we're Flying's done? too much work. We're done yeah. with you. We're going to walk away now. I, so that's. I think that's partly why I didn't believe they flew. But. i got turkeys that walk through my yard all the time, but... They're just teenagers that live down the block. <laughs> <laughs> hey, those are our listeners. I really don't yeah. think they are. <laughs> Thanks, Chris, 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 Krispy Kreme. Um, that helps a lot. Here's a story. Okay, now this connects. I want you to see how this connects. This connects from the uh, too big breast meat to the VMA <laughs> No, No, Look at My Butt Award show. Mm. Okay. A Mississippi woman gets a life sentence in fatal buttocks injection case. Jackson, Mississippi. How do you find this stuff, Phil? <laughs> I just want everyone to know that Phil does not clear this by us before we sit down and talk. Hey, let me just, let we're as surprised as you are. Fatal buttocks injection case. A Mississippi woman convicted of murder for administering an unlicensed silicone buttocks injection to a patient who later died. True. Tracy Lynn Gardner... So, but this patient requested this treatment. Yes. Performed the <laughs> unlicensed injection to have silicone injected into her buttocks to make them larger. Does this shot make my butt look big? Oh, good. Doesn't she know that you can get implants from the Sky Mall magazine? You can. No shots necessary? No surgery necessary. Or just do it the old-fashioned way and eat more. Uh, She uh, performed the injection in 2012 in her Jackson home on 37-year-old Karima Gordon, who fell ill immediately after the procedure. See, if if, if you get, like, you know, breast augmentation, they're not just squirting silicone into you. Right, it's in a... It's in a it's container. It's in case. She probably injected yes. the silicone right into her bloodstream or something. Yeah, and, and there was that issue Ouch. when some of the, the breast implants were leaking right. and it was causing disease because right. that's bad. You don't want silicone just floating right. around. Which is why they use saline now, right? Just That's right, they right. use saline. Yes. I'm up uh, on my breast yeah. implant technology, you know. Tracy Lynn Garner <sighs> important to faces me, yeah. a separate trial in the death of Marilyn Hale, an Alabama woman who authorities say died under similar circumstances two years earlier. Wow. Here's where the story gets really interesting, though, and should will probably be some kind of uh, hit TV show on HBO. Tracy Lynn Garner is transgender and is actually named Morris Garner. And the person who finds these patients for her and is now going to prison for misrepresenting herself as a nurse, 40-year-old Natasha Stewart, also known as Pebbles de Model. Pebbles with a Z. <laughs> D-A. I'm thinking of the Funstones. <laughs> model. That girl really went wrong, M-O-D-E-L. didn't she? M-O-D-E-L. Pebbles the model. Hmm. So Pebbles the model is the front for... The nurse. For Morris, in quotes. a.k.a. Tracy Lynn, to find women who want buttocks injections 
and don't think them through, and then they die. And where is this occurring? Yeah. Mississippi and Alabama. If the contact person is Pebbles the model, you wouldn't think it's a <laughs> reputable outfit. At least I would go, you know what? Pebbles the model, are you licensed? Are you? That's yeah. how, see, see, when we say things have turned upside down, that's what we mean because the, our bottoms have become the top, the most important thing. <laughs> oh. in a, when, the, when your bottom becomes your priority in life. Your top. You've, you've, re- you've reached the bottom. You've re- or the top. Or you the don't top. know. Yeah. You don't know. Uh, yeah. The posterior is the priority. Ooh, oh, I like the, that. What's the, what's the opposite of posterior? Anterior. 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 When yeah. your posterior is your anterior. So that's not very catchy. <laughs> Which means you have no interior. Ooh. Oh, that's good. Okay. That'll preach. Okay. Okay. okay, okay. This is interesting, too. And this plays yeah. into your, your thing. Your, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay. I want to see this segue. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't really a segue. This is just my next story. It's world, oh, okay. world news. Okay. World news. Apparently, Phil has to have at least one butt story in every episode now. <laughs> so we've cleared that hurdle. Thank you very much. A fatal buttocks injection. Okay, one last thought on that yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is that funeral like? She was a good Awkward. woman. But yeah, exactly. You, I think you tiptoe around yeah, the mode right. of death. Right. She went down butt first. It bit her in the butt. I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And what, did Pebbles DeModel show up at the funeral? <laughs> they probably have another friend who's an unlicensed uh, clergy who did the funeral. <laughs> <laughs> Pebbles the preacher? Okay. Bam, bam. So, so, uh, so the Middle East is going crazy. Oh, now we're going to something Whoa. really serious. Okay. This is great. What a nice well, segue. People are dying in both. I mean, yeah, I, I think, can. Yeah. Phil, you are ready for cable news. <laughs> I think I am. ISIS. You know about ISIS or oh, yes. ISIL or ISIS. Islamic or, State. Yeah, whatever, whatever yeah. it's called. Uh, did you hear what the British Prime Minister said? Yes. I think this is interesting. Okay, Tony, uh, not Tony Blair. Not Tony Blair, David Cameron. Uh, made a statement, attacked multiculturalism, and declared adherence to British values a duty, um, mm. as he's talking about ISIS. And the reason is because we're now discovering that British citizens and American citizens are going over and joining ISIS. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of freaking us out. Sure. It's like, why, why would you do that? Why would you even do that? And, and I thought this was interesting. So Cameron went on TV in the UK and said, uh, said that... Britain is an open, tolerant, and free nation. We are a country that backs people in every community who want to work hard, make a contribution, and build a life for themselves and their families. But he said, we cannot stand by and allow our openness to be confused with a tolerance of extremism or one that encourages different cultures to live separate lives and allows people to behave in ways that runs that run completely counter to our values. Adhering to British values is not an option or a choice. It is a duty for those who live in these islands. And in the end, it is only by standing up for these values that we will defeat the extremism, protect our way of life, and keep all our people safe. This is a mm. pretty remarkable That's... change from the rhetoric over the last 50 years. Yes. Yeah. So we've been yeah. going, particularly for the British, because there was, there was so much reaction against British imperialism and the notion of, you know, we show you how to live. Mm-hmm. We are the British. We, we are the pinnacle of civilization. And so there was that, that retreat from that, you really kind of globally, of saying nobody should tell anyone else how to live. You know, no one should tell anyone else what their values are. Every culture's values are equally mm-hmm. valid, you know, and we just we took values off the table as something that you can prescribe. And now suddenly, you know, so we, we've come to a point where we, we're not supposed to say that anyone is wrong. Mm-hmm. Or that anything is wrong because it's offensive, it's it's colonial, it's imperialist, um, and yet we're looking at things that we know are wrong. That is just that's just wrong, and pretending that they're not wrong, you know, just seems more and more ridiculous. So we're we're in a really, and I want to hear you talk about this because you write a lot about different worldviews and such, mm-hmm. but how how we're coming out of an era where we told ourselves we can't say anyone else is wrong and then looking at mm. things that are so obviously wrong and then you know just the the nuance that the british prime minister had to try to put into this to not sound like 
he was going back a hundred years to sure. British imperialism, but to say British value. He also got in trouble, you know, a few months ago for saying we should celebrate that Britain is is a Christian nation. That's right. Yeah. You know, and atheists wrote all sorts of letters to the editor and said, <laughs> "Well, no, 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 we're not. Take it back. Stop it." Yeah. So uh, how how do we move forward? How do you get back to? How can you say anything is wrong if if you've already said it's Im- imperialist to say that anything is wrong? Hmm. Yeah. Well, it is interesting because encountering raw evil is kind of the antidote to this soft-headed <laughs> um, idea of yeah. everything's okay. There's no such thing as truth, at least with a capital T, right? right? Because right. like you said, you see something like people being beheaded and you realize, oh, that's evil. We can't tolerate that. Right. That's um, definitely out of bounds. Yeah, exactly. And so that kind of makes people pull back and go, hey, just a minute, we need to talk about morality yeah. in absolute terms. But how do we do that? Yeah, it's tough in that kind of culture. I think I read an article recently and it, I think it was Marty Martin, Martin, Martin Marty, what's his mm. name? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Who, was, yeah. who was quoted by saying the, uh, the only way to overcome a bad story is with a good story. Hmm. And the story that's being told by ISIS and some of these Muslim extremists is, a, is what we would all consider an evil story, hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Where, where it becomes justifiable to behead somebody. And the rest of the world is looking at that and going, this is a problem, this is bad, right. and we're against it. And even what David Cameron says, I think it, it falls a little bit short because what is British values? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What are yeah. American values? Or what are I? So what we want to say is we know that story is bad, hmm. but we don't want to prescribe a good story because for us to prescribe a right. story is imperialistic. Sure. And that's where, I, you know, we've deconstructed so much of what was Western Christian values right. Right. to say everything's okay. And now we're confronted with another narrative, which mm-hmm. is completely antithetical to that, but we don't, we're not combating it with a narrative. Yeah. We're just saying we don't want that one either. Right, because we can't agree on a narrative. Right. Well, and because anymore. of postmodern thought, there's a deep suspicion of meta narratives is mm-hmm. what you're talking about. Right. These kind of big mm-hmm. overarching stories that give meaning to a people mm-hmm. and we're very Partly pluralistic. because they were used to oppress people. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. And some of that's legitimate, right? Right. Um, because how can one story encompass reality for everyone? Right. Um, and yet, you know, that's ultimately what holds a society together is at least having some sort of meta narrative that people can right. go, yeah, I'm kind of on board right. with that. This reminded me of, because um, I was rereading... Dallas Willard's The Divine Conspiracy, and in the, the opening chapter, he talks about the story of a, a, a student from the Midwest, a girl from the Midwest who was attending Harvard and quit and, and was giving an exit interview as to why she was leaving, uh, and, she, and it was a psychology professor. She was teaching or learning psychology, and she said uh, that she worked cleaning rooms to put herself through college. And the way the other students demeaned her because she was in that position Hmm. and also propositioned her, you know, and that these were the same students that were in her philosophy and ethics classes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And getting great grades. And and her, her, her frustration was to her professor was, how can we be talking about what is right and wrong and good and bad and and have it not affecting anyone's lives you know yeah. why aren't we becoming good when we're talking about the good and the professor wrote a column about it later for hmm. a, for a journal and just said he he was completely dumbfounded right. he, he had nothing sure. to say yeah that's a that's a popular secular fallacy that education especially higher education will make people moral and you think yeah. the most extreme example is the Nazis. They'd listen to Beethoven and Bach and read Nietzsche and then go kill right. people, right? Right. Um, right? And there was no apparent contradiction. You can't educate people right. out of immorality. This but I know you know that, Phil. I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure. pointing a finger at you. I'm trying. <laughs> well, back when this podcast began, one of our first guests was Oz Guinness, and he was talking about his book, um, A Free People's Suicide, mm-hmm. which was a quote from Abraham Lincoln saying that America would never be invaded from a foreign power, and if this country ever falls, it will be by suicide. Hmm. And the argument that Oz made, which has been made by leaders throughout the centuries, is that for a people to be free, to be 
unrestrained by government, they have to be virtuous. Mm -hmm. They have to have an, their right. own internal virtue right. that governs their lives. Otherwise, you have to have the external constraints, just like children. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. as we lose our virtue, we have to have more and more external constraint. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's what David Cameron is getting at, is Western societies, liberal democracies, have been so affirming to every worldview and every idea that right. um, they haven't cultivated a shared virtue in their population. If, if you're unwilling to say anything is wrong, right. how can you say that anything is right? Well, and it's not just saying, I mean, I think, lose both. I think British society would probably be universally saying that murder is wrong. It isn't like they're not getting that message. No, no. What they've forgotten is that there's this pocket of people within England, within Great Britain, who have been so isolated in their own community, yeah. an mm -hmm. immigrant mm -hmm. community of, of Muslims, that the broader narrative of, of Great Britain has not infiltrated that narrative which they brought with them or have, mm -hmm. has been ext mm -hmm. uh, become but an extreme the, narrative. But some of the people that are, that are joining aren't, they're not immigrants. You know, but they're in the community of immigrants. Yeah. Okay. And they're and they're there's such a powerful narrative there. They want to be a part of this right. yeah. Islamic yeah. movement. There are, there are three three at least three people have joined ISIS from one high school in Minnesota. <gasps> really? <Yeah>. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't have a recruiting problem. No. Because that's, they have this powerful narrative. They're going right. to form this new caliphate that's going to spread from Asia to the Middle East. That's, and it's just the last people yeah. you would suspect showing up there would be Minnesotans. Well, it's much warmer <laughs> in, in the Middle East. I think that's <laughs> the main draw. Yeah. yeah. If they have to but kill how people. Can you foment terror when you're frozen. See, because it had they had, yeah. they had to start thinking like that while they were still in Minnesota. But That's my true. my I don't know I haven't heard that story. But my guess is that these yeah. three people from Minnesota probably felt very marginalized yeah, and sure. outside the mainstream of American culture. I bet and it all comes down to cheerleaders making fun of them in high school. Isn't that where most of the world's <laughs> evil comes from? You're gonna blame cheerleaders? Yeah, the cheerleaders made fun of. Is this I, back to butts? Yeah. <laughs> is it? I I'm think, sorry. I think Are Phil's we not supposed to be talking about ourselves. <laughs> yeah, that's what it oh, feels revealing a little, a little projection too going much. on there. <laughs> Did it happen to you guys too? <sighs> feels a very vulnerable okay. ISIS recruit, apparently. One more thing on this topic, though. I think in the West, we often look at terrorists, ISIS, and go, oh, those poor guys, they just don't have jobs. It's all economic, it's sociological. There's an element of truth to that. But it doesn't explain why, for instance, bin Laden, the son of a billionaire, chose to live in caves mm, and right. pursue this, this uh, jihad. So. I think we're, partly because we don't have the expertise often in the Western world to understand their theological uh, reasonings for their actions, mm -hmm. but it is theological sometimes. Mm -hmm. They have an extreme form of Islam well, that they're adhering to. Let, let's back up one second, though. I, I agree with you, but when you think about it, the economic argument actually holds some water because what is the overriding narrative of the West, or at least of America? It's the American dream narrative that if you play by the rules in America, you yep. can be rich and successful. Yeah. And when that narrative is not available to you, and it isn't to most of us, frankly, but, no. then then the alternative narratives begin to look really good, like That's the, true. the alternative yeah. radical narrative of Islam in an immigrant community. So what we don't have in America— And that might pull people out of the West. Yeah. That wouldn't right. necessarily explain the, the No, the I agree regional. there. But in both yeah. cases, there's not an alternative narrative which is accessible to everyone. Sure, mm -hmm. yeah. We don't have a narrative in North America that reaches everybody and gives dignity to everyone's life if you're not rich and famous. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. You can still go out for American Idol. That's true. Which that, is that's the, the dream rich and of famous. getting rich and famous. <laughs> yeah, right. so that hope is still there. <laughs> the hope's there. Right, and that's that what people... Still there. I saw an ad. I saw an ad a couple of days ago, and it was, a, it was a, a cute young girl at work at a hip place, and it, it was about her wonderful day she was having, and she was on time for the bus. The bus was right there and said, the elevator was waiting for you, and you even got the last... Oh, I've seen that. Have you seen that? You yes. even got the last yeah. cupcake. And I'm like, wow, what, is, what are we selling here? And it said, so this is the day... You should play the lottery, <laughs> but see, you got to be in it to win it. What? That's a great example. The, the, since since the West has abandoned the Christian narrative, yeah. the narrative that's come into place is the narrative of wealth and celebrity. It's right. a consumer yep. narrative, yep. right? And for most of us, we might strive for it, but we're never going to achieve it, right? And in that disappointment, then Speak what, do you, yourself, what do you turn to? <laughs> you, 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 I'm, has, I'm on the Phil Fisher podcast. That's yeah. right. Drew has a new book out. <laughs> Everything so, from here on out is gravy. Is it any wonder why we live in a medicated therapeutic society? Because most yeah. people mm -hmm. are disappointed mm -hmm. having not achieved you the can. narrative they were right. sold as a kid. Right. And yeah. and then we export that to the Middle East or to Afghanistan or to these 
uh, developing countries or, or Muslim countries, and we say, hey, look, you should embrace a Western democratic consumeristic narrative, and they're going, uh-uh. uh-uh. It, look what it produces. It right. produces yeah. VMA and, and medicated people. <laughs> yeah. So, the, and then the only <laughs> other alternative. Cyrus. And Justin Bieber, who was arrested over the weekend for hey, apparently let's having not bash a, on Canadians. another altercation with paparazzi. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. While driving Selena Gomez on an ATV. Wow. There was, there was a traffic accident between an ATV and an SUV. The SUV was filled with paparazzi taking pictures, and the ATV was Justin Bieber and Selena Gomez, and it turned into a physical altercation. Isn't that fun? That's great. That's just that, fun. That's what makes our country He's wonderful. like 5'6", 130 pounds. Yeah, if there's anyone who needs a buttocks <laughs> injection, it's Justin Bieber. I think he may have had one. They just injected it in the wrong end. <laughs> Hey, we should stop right now because I got my song. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Although I do like, okay, my friend um, Peter Bogosian, Dr. Bogosian, mm-hmm. uh, an atheist author that's been on the show. Friend of the show. Yeah. Uh, he ba- makes the point, and I'm completely with him, that he, he rails against relativism. He mm-hmm. says we have to have the ability to judge ideas. Yes. You know, we cannot put mm-hmm. ourselves in a corner where we say all ideas are equal. And he even, I was talking to him the other day, um, and he was talking about relativism and egalitarianism. You know, egalitarianism. We think everything should be equal. Everyone is the same. Everything that, is equal. That term has a different connotation in the church, you know. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, that's okay. not this part of the conversation. <laughs> and then relativism, which says, you know, everything, you can't measure anything. It's just everything is relative. Right. And he says what most, what most mm. liberal moderns don't realize is that you can't hold both those positions. Because if you can't sure. measure anything, you can't say it's all equal. Right. You know, you can't, because yeah. e- you can't even put a value on anything. Or it's all equally so, meaningless, right? That's about the only thing you can say, yeah. is that, that everything is, is Well, I think, I think it comes from a good place. We want to say that everyone is equal, right? Which is true, I believe. Everyone but is they, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. in their own way. I wouldn't even try to sing, but that's okay. that's a that was good. Lie. But there's a category <laughs> confusion because we... <laughs> Wow. Thanks for disabusing me. <laughs> well, Sky I guess my will mom not be writing Christian greeting cards anytime soon. I guess oh. my mom always lied to me then. <laughs> okay, but then we transfer that over into the marketplace of ideas. Yeah, and say, oh, right. right, all ideas are equal, especially if they're passionately held. That's what right. it's you know, what's it called? Philosophical emotivism. Something Ooh, that's a big one, huh? Yeah. Okay. But it's something has worth simply because you believe it passionately enough. Right. I'm going to be famous, say and that I really, again. really believe what, it. What's the term? Uh, philosophical emotivism. I see now, audience. You just yeah. you just earned your your <laughs> podcast. Worth, got your money worth back. The zero dollars. Uh, I've been waiting to, to get that in. Podcast. That's good. You yeah. should copyright that. <laughs> oh, it ain't mine. TM. Philosophical emotivism. All right. Okay. We, we need to talk about something else. I'm holding up the magazine again, Leadership <laughs> Journal, uh, edited by the two fellows sitting to my left. That's actually a scan of Drew's brain on the this cover. This is a yeah. scan of Drew's brain. Neuroministry, how brain science informs discipleship. Mm-hmm. That's like the nuttiest thing I've ever heard. I know. That, I know. that couldn't even possibly be true. Who needs how, a brain? How did this come up? Why did you? Why is Leadership Journal devoting an entire issue to the brain? Because we think God loves brains. <laughs> Is that weird? Because okay. all brains are beautiful. All and brains equally, are beautiful. Equally beautiful. Well, they're not actually. But yeah, that is also false. Yeah. <laughs> How'd this come up? It's demonstrably untrue. No, it's, you know, uh, neuroscience is a burgeoning field. Um, we've only really been scanning brains for 20, 30 years. Right. And we're finding out all kinds of fun and funky things about the gray matter in between our ears. <laughs> and, of course, you see this, you know, come up in articles. Oh, how does, you know, uh, neuroscience affect dating, love, the, oh, you right, know, every right. topic imaginable. Right. And we thought, does this have something to say about ministry? Interesting. And I think it does if you think of the fact that we've learned a lot about addictions, for instance, um, habit formation, all these things. And then does it really have nothing to say about discipleship? Mm-hmm. And so that was the thinking behind it. And okay. we interviewed some experts. And Yeah, John yeah. Ortberg. Yeah. John Ortberg wrote a big article, which has some interesting stuff in it. He actually writes an article for every issue of Leadership Journal. A lot of people don't know that. Yes, yeah. he's a regular. I know that. Yeah. This is actually the first... Copy of Leadership Journal I've ever had. It's gonna change your of, life. Now my mom always subscribed. Oh really? So, yeah, it was it, it was actually always in our bathroom when I was growing up. Leadership Journal. <laughs> I'm glad to know it has that association. It was for you. In our, we did a lot of reading in the bathroom as a family. It was together. It was family. Time. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, okay. kids. It's Get a little crowded in there, but story time. <laughs> 
<laughs> Story time on the toilet. Um, uh, uh, people don't know this, but uh, Marshall Shelley, who is the editor yeah. of, of Leadership Journal, has been there for my boss thirty some yeah. years. Um, he has a brain. Yeah, he he <laughs> he got a, an article submitted years ago from an unknown youth pastor that he thought could write pretty well, and so he published him. Hmm. His name was John Ortberg. No way. Oh, I didn't and even know this that story. That brought John Ortberg into the attention of various other people. He eventually got hired by wow. Willow Creek on staff there, mm-hmm. and now, of course, is a best selling author and on and on. Wow. So, John has been on CT's board, and he re- writes in every issue of Leadership Journal, and wow. it's because we discovered him. I, I <laughs> did not know that. Do you know, yeah. do you know what Marshall Shelley also holds the distinction of? I think he was the first person who was ever offered. An advertisement for Veggie Tales ah, to oh, run in ah. a magazine because I I wanted to place an ad in Christian uh, today's Christian women or Christian parenting or I forget which magazine. And what did he say? Yeah, he said I'll take your money <laughs> and I'll put the ad in the magazine. Wow! Yeah. And then so, he, so and he, then discovered he put it in there. Two, okay. he, yeah, he discovered Great. John Ortberg and Bob the Tomato. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a purchasing vegetable of advertising. All roads lead through Marshall Shelley. Uh, so John oh, Ortberg totally. writes totally. in his uh, rather long article, pastors can offer great help to their congregation when we simply acknowledge the reality that followers of Jesus do not get a free pass from mental health problems. Christians have brains and neurons that are as <laughs> fallible as atheist neurons and new age neurons. Isn't that true? Is it, is it, I mean, is that true? I think so. You think that's Based true? Based on my extensive research. But can't we pray our neurons away? <laughs> Some Christians have, I'm afraid. Pray your neurons away. That's a good I slogan. That could song. catch on. Neuron sounds a little bit like moron. You're right. I know. <laughs> You're just a neuron. Otherwise, and this is why this is why the topic of neuroscience is a little bit controversial, because uh, he says uh, today the easiest way to get an article published is to pick huh. any human behavior and number one show which parts of the brain are most active when thinking about that topic. Number two, explain why evolutionary psychology has shown that behavior to be important to our survival, and then number three, give four common sense tips for handling that behavior better. None of which has anything to do with number one or number two. Huh. Yeah. That's where I, you know, that's where I, I think people get a little reactive to neuroscience because, like, like many fields of evolutionary biology or, or you know, cosmology, some people are using it with kind of a, a philosophical agenda. Absolutely. They say, well, this explains why people still believe in God. Sure. Even though we all know now, there's no such thing. There's that article about, well, many articles about the God gene. Right. supposedly identifying a gene that kind of explains Here's away religious, religious experience why. or someone devised a God helmet that you can wear that apparently stimulates... Would it make you look like God? <laughs> or give you God-like give you, powers? Give you the body of a God? I don't know. Uh, no, just it gives you this, uh, I don't know, sense of euphoria. Sounds or, like the premise of a Marvel movie. But often yeah. these things are... <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> Who stole the God helmet? <laughs> Loki. <laughs> Loki, was that you? <laughs> Yeah, and so it, basically a lot of the, the literature on this has been overly simplified or just flatly false. Yeah. And, and especially when it's used, like you said, to advance a philosophical agenda of trying to explain away anything supernatural. And so Christians right. rightly react right. to that and go, hey, wait a minute. But I think the so other extreme, reject though, it completely? exactly, you don't want to throw it all out, right? Because there's a lot of useful stuff. Like you think of um, if you're a communicator, for instance, you're a preacher, yeah. you want to know how people's brains work so you can connect better with them. Has, have any preachers tried putting their congregations in MRIs during a sermon? In a God helmet? Yeah, just to see how... I think some preachers have put them into comas. <laughs> <laughs> That's your next greeting card. There you there go. You go. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wrote a piece in that in that issue on. What was, on yeah, I didn't read your yeah, piece because you I couldn't find it. Right well, it's buried it. in the back. It's a <laughs> it's column. Like, it's a. It's, it's where they go. Like right next to the ads for. for hey, most people read back to front. And, and back to yeah, front. Yeah, you know that's true. Most people. Oh, really? Yeah. Brain science has proven that most people, when they pick up a magazine, <laughs> go to the back first. Well, it's easier to open the magazine like that. That's exactly. That's sure. Yeah. Sure. Oh, look, funny cartoons. No. So no, I wrote about. On? I wrote about. Um, Brain science and what it says about communication and preaching, and that people actually retain more. How did you know this stuff? You're not an expert on brain I science. I read experts. Oh, okay. And then I regurgitate. <laughs> okay. Well, so give it so the argument is that when, 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 I'll give you an illustration. When you're in, a, in an environment where there's some background noise, like a cafe, 
yeah. and you're talking to somebody, you actually your brain has to work a little bit harder to listen to the conversation mm -hmm. and ends up retaining more information than if you were trying to listen to somebody in a completely quiet room. So the idea there is when something is too easy, the brain doesn't actually engage very well. But when there's a little bit of effort required, mm -hmm. the brain engages better and retains more information. So my argument was when you make preaching or the worship setting too easy, too comfortable, yeah. uh, too simple, yeah. too quiet, people won't actually retain what's being said. But if they're challenged a little bit, if they have to think a little harder, if they're made so, a little uncomfortable... Like if you skip every fifth word in your sermon. <laughs> That's one way to do it. Or you can just look at the way Jesus taught. Cryptically. He taught, he uh, he taught in a way that made people have to stop and actually focus and right. think about what he was saying. He taught in okay. hmm. stories and parables, in crowded environments, and he didn't make it as simple as possible to understand. He made people have to work a little bit for it. And what we've tended to do is overemphasize making communication super simple and easy, right. and then wonder why no one ever retains anything. I got anything. three points for you. And it's and on a slide. And they start with so you, R. Right. <laughs> and here's a handout with the blank for you to fill in. Which essentially yes. what you're saying yeah. to the brain is just check out for the next 30 minutes because you don't need to engage. Right. Hmm. So how do we know if I'm a pastor? Okay, I'm a pastor listening to the Phil Vischer podcast. And I say, okay, how do I know if it's too easy? How, how is what you just said well, actually applicable you have to, to me? You probably have to know your congregation because if your congregation oh. is, is full of pebbles... <laughs> with a Z, with a Z, Pebbles with Pebbles. A Z. then then yeah. what qualifies as easy may be quite different than yeah. if you're context you is everything. Know Pebbles, you she might be a Rhodes Pebbles. Scholar. Yeah, she come on, don't be judgmental. In, I mean, she's pulling off quite a scam. I think there's, <laughs> there's some thinking going on there. Okay, so I hear you. Yeah. So know yeah. your know you your, know your audience. audience. Yeah. Another thing, and this is maybe obvious, but the more um, senses you can involve yeah. when you're communicating, mm -hmm. the more um, areas of the brain are engaged, okay. and the greater the retention okay. of knowledge. So, well, yeah. so while so you're we need preaching, <laughs> smell of yes. smell of vision, squirt, <laughs> squirt some perfume yeah. for different. Or don't concepts. shower for a few weeks before you go up there. <laughs> Just what say, about, hey guys, I'm doing it for you. What about like utilizing a ukulele? Oh, that's gold. Because that <gasps> you can. Plinky Pete's over. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, Matt Woodley, a friend of a friend of mine yeah. who preaches occasionally at the church I attend, um, I remember his sermon is like a month or so ago because he brought up a bat and a glove and told this story about Little League and stuff. I mean, yeah. just these simple objects. Sometimes it can be done in a hokey kind of manner. Yeah. But like it a drone. Worked. <laughs> don't even go there. Don't even go there. So you don't know nothing about that. Okay. Uh, Ortberg <laughs> also talks about, about yeah. habit. Oh, I love this. Which seems like yeah. kind of a big point. Um, neuroscience has shown us in concrete ways a reality of human existence that is crucial for disciples to understand in our struggle with sin. The reality is this. Mostly, our behavior does not consist of a series of conscious choices. Mostly, our behavior is governed by habit. Most of the time, a change in behavior requires an acquisition of new habits. Willpower and conscious decision have very little power over what we do. Uh, the capacity for habitual behavior is indispensable. When you first learn how to type or tie a shoe or drive a car, it's hard work. So many little steps to remember. But after you learn, it becomes habitual. That's right. I can tie my shoes like nothing. <laughs> I am so good at it now. And I used to be really terrible. You should have seen it just a few years ago. <laughs> it was a mess. I used to have Sky yeah. tie my shoes yeah. for me because I couldn't do it. That's awkward. After you learn, it becomes habitual. That means it is quite literally in your body or muscle memory at the level of your neural pathways. Neurologists call this process where the brain converts a sequence of actions into routine activity chunking. 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 That's chunking. chunking, which is also after that wild frat party That's what you did in the... exactly where my mind was yeah. going. <laughs> chunking turns out to be one of the most important <laughs> dynamics in terms of sin and discipleship. Following Jesus is, to a large degree, allowing the Holy Spirit to rechunk my life. <laughs> T-shirt! Hey, book right there, man. Rechunk your life. Rechunk, rechunk my life, re sweet your Jesus. Life. That's a bestseller. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and neurologists have this expression. I Wasn't guess. that a I'm character told. from the Goonies? Rechunk? Chunk. <laughs> chunk? I think there was a chunk. Chunk and rechunk. Chunk there was a chunky rechunk. kid yeah, in there. The, the yeah. twins. But neurons that fire together, wire together. So it's just a fancy what? way of... 
neurons Families that, that pray together, stay together. Hey, maybe that's where that came neurons from. Neurons that fire together, wire, wire together. In other words, you can kind of like wear these neural paths in your brain. Yeah. And until you do that, it takes intentionality. And then after a while, it just right. happens automatically. One fascinating thing about the science of habits is that people who are, you know, undisciplined in their life, they're trying, they're failing, whether it's eating, work, whatever, yeah. versus people that are super disciplined. The undisciplined ones are actually expending more willpower on a day-to-day -day basis because yeah. the other people have developed these habits. So they're almost on rails. They can just go. Um, and so when you right. think about the implications that has for discipleship, it's really fascinating. It's not just so, it's a battle of willpower every time. You have to get these habits, holy habits, ingrained in your life. Which right. is what the role of spiritual disciplines is supposed to be, is to train exactly. us in it's habits. rewiring right. neurons. So, wow. So the church fathers knew about neuroscience. Totally. So when Paul says, I beat my body into submission. In the Greek, it says, beat my brain. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds convincing, though, right, if you yeah, say in the you Greek. You had me. Yeah, you had so me beat my on. neurons. <laughs> beat uh, my neurons. <laughs> the, well, this is very... Even in the, in the Old Testament, there were set practices of, of offices of prayer where the Jews would pray at regular sure. intervals yeah. during the day, and that was a, a pattern habit-forming thing, or having children memorize the Torah, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. those were all habit-forming. So I wonder if, if like, the, the traditions of Islam, for example, oh, yeah. actually mm. make the faith stickier. Yes. Because yeah. it just... It just it, the five times a day prayer, right. you know, very mechanical. It wire yeah. your Absolutely. life so that it's hard to change. And that's one of the reasons why, as the church mm. has stripped away its traditions, Right, and, we it's don't do that and it's liturgies and it's recited prayers. Remember like a rosary? So all, that, that's Remember, all legalism. Have you ever have a rosary, anyone? Mm, no. no. Don't tell me you have a rosary. No, I don't have a rosary. <laughs> no, because we don't do that sort of thing. Sure. We had the wordless glove. That's what. Did you ever have a no. wordless glove? Did no. you have the wordless book? Sounds terrifying. Did you have the wordless yeah, book? Oh, yes, I did. With yes, the colors? For evangelism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, yes, for sure. child evangelism. Yes. Poor children can't read. Yeah, so we make yeah. a book with no words, and it's just five or six colors. Right. You know, the red for the blood, and the black for the sin, and the white for the whatever, and yeah. the, and the you green is snow. You had the wordless glove? White for the... Yes. And that sounds like something a version of it. So doctor you, would use. You would hold up each <laughs> finger rather <laughs> carefully. You really don't want that red finger. <laughs> I'm going to give you the red finger. You hold up each finger, and you could tell the story of the gospel. Which one was the middle finger? <laughs> I don't remember. So it didn't work. So it didn't work. You I, don't even have it in I your know, mind. It didn't yeah. work. All I remember is that we had a traveling child evangelist family come to our church in, oh, in the trailer in Iowa. Yeah. In the trailer, you've said they pulled before, a trailer yes. behind their truck that was a miniature church. It was a tiny, and they called it the chapel on wheels. And wow. and all the kids would come out in the evening service Sunday night and go to the chapel on wheels. And they had like small size. Pews and How many kids would fit in this? Oh, maybe 30 kids would fit. Um, oh, maybe not that many. Maybe 20 kids in the chapel That's on still wheels. quite a few. I know. And we'd all get into the <laughs> chapel on wheels. And not only did they have wordless gloves, they had wordless curtains. The chapel on wheels had wordless curtains. See, this, I could learn everything I needed to know about theology from the curtains. When you say the wordless book, that's kind of clever because yeah, yeah, books yeah. have words. But yeah. wordless glo curtains. gloves and curtains aren't supposed to have words <laughs> no. on them. And that's that just sounds just, creepy. That's just dumb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's wow. Like Mormon underpants. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> They're wordless, They're too. Word well, Are they? I don't know. I don't even know. Okay. Okay. My <laughs> underpants have words on them. <laughs> wrap it up. Pains? But here's... Okay, yeah. okay. Application. Application time. <laughs> now that you know this, how would you disciple people differently? Hmm... This guy. <laughs> what? what? You're the. You're the <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't like what, bringing it down that practical. You, <laughs> Come on. What would you do differently? Um, besides recognizing that this takes work on the front well, end. Well, one one thing I would so appeal to is the is end. the writing of James K. A. Smith. Who dat? Who, oh yeah. He's a philosopher at Calvin College. I G G Y. He he's written a couple books about. Um, <sighs> well, his books are all really good. I'm reading another one right now. But he's written about the importance of of liturgy and symbol in our church traditions as communication vehicles okay. of Christian doctrine. As and neuron truth. rewirers? Yes. As and, rechunkers? And that we, mm. we, we should be reluctant to abandon those things, even though so many churches have. We already have. did. Too late. And we've abandoned them in the name of reaching more people or being seeker-sensitive or whatever right. it might be, but those are the very qualities of a community, the symbols and the traditions and the recitations and things that actually, in a 
multi-sensory way end up communicating, especially young people, mm-hmm. into the, the core teachings of the faith. That's a biggie. And then another yeah. one is recognize that spiritual disciplines, um, the reason they're disciplines is because we don't do them naturally. Right. And the goal mm-hmm. ultimately mm-hmm. is to rewire our habits so that we will do them naturally, in which case they cease to be a discipline. Mm-hmm. My fasting neurons are completely unwired. Yeah. But a lot of people have this <laughs> magical perception of, of spiritual disciplines, right. and they're not. Right. They're not magical. Yeah. But, I, I find it telling that, like, striving's become a dirty word right. in evangelicalism, because we mm-hmm. think that anything re- that requires effort somehow is legalistic. Right. Yeah. You it know, or it's rote stuff, or thou, that's what, you know, the right. high church people do. Right. Um, and I'm not saying that you have to, like, adopt all those you practices. I want you to me on the forehead. I want to... F- be slain in the yeah, spirit. Yeah, that's right. And, and I want to wake up all better. Yeah. yeah. So I think just by prepping uh, young people, any people, really by saying, you know, sanctification is hard. And it, takes it, it doesn't mean that you right. get credit yeah. for it. It's God working so in you, but it's going to be tough and you have to develop these habits. means in our churches, we need to preach on spiritual disciplines more than once. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Dallas Willard has a wonderful <clears throat> quote. He says, um, grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. Mm. Uh, and that's what we've that's gotten good. confused about. We think if I have to put any effort forward, then I'm not relying right. on God's grace. Yeah. And that's not biblical at all. Paul speaks against that. Peter speaks against that in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Effort is required in the Christian life. And just because you're exerting effort doesn't mean you're not open to God's grace. Wow. In fact, it takes God's grace to even have the will to pursue that effort. And to chunk. Right. So we have to work at it, but not to earn it. Right. It's to tricky. Actually, make it stick. Anything Why can't that we the Holy Spirit just rewire our neurons for us, like all at once. Is it <laughs> is it because we're incarnate beings? Why can't the Holy Spirit just make me thin all at once? We are, That's what I want. We're, we're called to... There's this, there's this paradox going on. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Yeah. Why? I don't know. Because it is God who's at work within you. Okay. Uh, yeah. And the imagery there that yeah. Paul's using of fear and trembling is he's hearkening back to the image of God descending upon Sinai when the Israelites are gathered around the mountain. Oh. And he gives the Ten Commandments to Moses. Remember, the smoke came down onto the fire, the whole, I mean, on the mountain, the yeah. whole mountain trembled. Yeah. And anyone who touched it, any animal who touched it would immediately... So there's this fear hmm. and trembling at the presence of God. And so he's saying that same power is now at work in you through the hmm. presence of the Holy Spirit. So we have a responsibility, just as the Israelites did, to seek after God and his commands, but recognize that this power is now within you, and there's this paradox going on mm-hmm. that we, we seek, and yet we also trust that God's the one at work. Right. So it's not an either-or. It's a both-and. Is that why <clears throat> so few people in the history of the church, well, I mean, so many people in the history of the church haven't really come close to actually getting it. Why you can have so many people that are just along for the ride, because it's just not as easy as you'd think. <laughs> That's opening up a whole other can of worms. Okay. I'm not going to quite go okay. there. Well, I'm just thinking about You're... the church in European history and you know, you know how it could so easily just become about politics or, or even today just yeah. about politics or just about you know a, a racial superiority or just about economics. And you, because the heart of it is this relationship right. that is so personal and actually takes focus. And we want a system. We want right. a political mm-hmm. system, mm-hmm. an economic yeah. system. Properly understood, the Christian life can never be commodified, put on a shelf, and yeah. created into a system. At the end of the day, whenever you take Jesus out of the center, you end up with one of these malformations of Christian faith. Hmm. That's well said. What are we going to do, Drew? I don't know. What are we going to do? That's no, tough. It is a tough one. All right, I'm going to sing about it, though. <laughs> <laughs> I love this whole uh, re-chunk. That's, that's yeah. my word of the day. The re-chunking? Yeah. re-chunking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I need Excuse to be re-chunked. me, honey, I'm re-chunking. <laughs> I love the dinner, however. I want to use the other bathroom. <laughs> Excuse me while I re-chunk. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, instead of sanctification, he's now re-chunking us. Mm-hmm. Hey, Sky, <laughs> would you like to be a monk? All you have to do is let God re-chunk your neurons. It'll make you feel great Even though it's hard work You should put it on your plate To fast or read 
or uh, what, name some other disciplines, or spend time spend time alone. Because you can't read chunk if you're always on your phone. <laughs> That's good. Gotta let the Holy Spirit do his work. But if we think that's all it takes, then we'll miss the part that we play as well. Today, I tell you to go home and read your Bible in chunk. Okay, goodbye. See you next week. (laughs) 